So I am happy to introduce our speaker for today, Liam Wolf. Liam is a conservation ecologist with a deeply rooted passion for avian conservation stemming from his childhood interest in birds. He graduated from Augusta University in 2018 with a bachelor's degree in ecology and became involved in research monitoring endangered birds in Texas and investigating stopover habitat for migratory songbirds on the Gulf Coast. He studied backwind sparrow occupancy and vocalizations in Texas for his master's degree at Stephen F. Austin State University, graduating in 2002. He is now a research specialist at Texas A&M Corpus Christi, investigating colonial bird nesting habitat availability and productivity in the Laguna Madre. And with that, uh, Liam, I am going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Tanya. Um, thank you for the introduction. I uh, just want to clarify that I graduated with my master's in 2022 instead of 20 or 2002. <laughs> but anyway, um, thank you folks for your attendance today. It's great to be here. Um, I'm excited today to talk to you about my master's research on Bachman Spare in Texas. Um, and before I begin, I just want to say that this project was conducted when I was a graduate student, a master's student at Stephen F. Austin State University. Um, and it was funded through the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department State Wildlife Grant and USDA McIntyre Stennis Grant. Um, so before I start, I just wanted to thank those organizations for supporting this project. So to begin, um, I want to talk about the severity of bird decline in recent years. In 2019, Rosenberg et al. Um, released a sobering statistic that three billion birds have been lost in the last 50 years in the United States and Canada. Uh, that's approximately 27% of all avifauna in this region. Today, the IUCN um, considers 77 bird species as vulnerable, threatened, or endangered. So there's no question that conservation efforts are needed to mitigate or reverse these population trends for as many species as possible. Wildlife management is a vital tool in our conservation toolbox for tackling this issue. And successful management requires an understanding of when and where a species is likely to occur. But knowledge of these factors of occurrence isn't always enough. Um, it's necessary to understand what drives these factors of occurrence to maximize our conservation efforts. Reliable conservation efforts require uh, correct information to promote accurate management. Um, this is crucial because inaccurate results can lead to misled management decisions which have repercussions on your study species um, or could waste valuable dollars thanks to poor science. Uh, for example, the alleged rediscovery of the ivory-billed woodpecker led to a waste in about $20 million towards the recovery of a ghost based on these low-resolution um, video frames. Such high stake conservation decisions should be based on sound empirical science. For this reason, the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department developed the Texas Conservation Action Plan to address the rapid decline of species in the state with a specific aim in preventing species from being listed as threatened or endangered. This plan declared 112 bird species as species of greatest conservation need and that included 24 species that were already listed as threatened or endangered in the state. The Texas Conservation Action Plan provides a roadmap that guides management for these species of greatest conservation need in Texas, but for it to be effective, more information on the management needs of, of these species are needed. As a result, Mark Anderson and Gary Bovis of the Wyoming Natural Diversity Database in the University of Wyoming, produced species distribution models for 26 species of greatest conservation need in Texas in 2013 for an array of different taxa. Uh, these species distribution models are spatial models that categorize parts of Texas as either low, medium, or high likelihood of occurrence for each of these species of greatest conservation need based on known records um, of, for the species paired with environmental data, including climate, topography, land use, and land cover, soils and substrate, and surface water. Bachman's sparrow is uh, among the 24 birds that are um, 
listed as state threatened um, in Texas and are is a species of greatest conservation need. Um, this species has a severely fragmented habitat or uh, severely fragmented distribution across the southeastern United States due to decades of land conversion um, and poor habitat management. Bachman sparrow is heavily dependent on grass. Um, it uses blue stem and other bunch grasses for foraging, for cover, and for nesting. However, across much of its range, fire suppression has permitted the encroachment of woody vegetation that shades out the grass that Bachman sparrow is reliant on. Um, and as a result, frequent fires are necessary for the persistence of Bachman sparrow, um, and the species is known to abandon sites that are burned less frequently than uh, three years. In Texas, the range of Bachman sparrow is restricted to the piney woods um, and post oak savanna ecoregions of Texas. Um, and comparing the Texas Breeding Bird Atlas map here to the Anderson and Bovis species distribution model, there are some inconsistencies on where Bachman sparrow should occur. So this map on the left shows possible, probable, and confirmed breeding records of Bachman sparrow in the state uh, based on a thorough catalog of all regions of Texas that uh, are searching for breeding birds. In the Anderson and Bovis species distribution model, we see that um, there is predicted to be a moderate likelihood of Bachman sparrow occurrence in the Edwards Plateau and Hill Country region. And this is contrary to what the literature says about the distribution of Bachman sparrow in the state. So it stands to reason, therefore, that the Anderson and Bovis um, species distribution model might not be the most accurate representation of Bachman sparrow likelihood of occurrence in the state. And ground proofing of the distribution model should be conducted so that uh, state agencies can be informed not only on its efficacy, but what habitat characteristics actually promote occupancy of the species in the state. Our objectives um, of our effort, therefore, were to assess the efficacy of this uh, species distribution model for Bachman sparrow in Texas, while determining what spatial and temporal drivers um, affect or drive these patterns of occurrence in Texas. Um, and this is significant because this knowledge on when and where the species occurs is crucial for guiding appropriate management um, efforts in the state for Bachman sparrow. Um, such as the Texas Conservation Action Plan. Furthermore, Bachman sparrow is an indicator of healthy pine savanna ecosystems, so its presence or absence tells us a lot about the quality of this biodiverse habitat, um, which is home to you know many game species as well. So our research focused on these two aspects of the ecology of Bachman sparrow in Texas that can inform management efforts. We focused on the spatial components um, that are associated with Bachman sparrow in Texas. And secondly, the temporal window of Bachman sparrow singing phenology that can clarify peak detectability for the species in the state. And to start off, I'm going to be covering the spatial factors of occurrence. For this first section, we sorry, we hypothesized that Bachman sparrow will be, will be um, detected mostly in the high likelihood category of that species distribution model. And moreover, that covariates that are associated with an open understory and dense herbaceous ground cover are gonna best predict uh, where Bachman sparrow will occur. And to accomplish our objectives, we surveyed 80 plots in each of these three categories, low, medium, high, to identify positive or negative detections of Bachman sparrow. So in this map, we see this gray area here is our low probability category and the plots in that category are represented by blue dots. While medium is represented here in this tan area with white dots, those are our medium plots. And then finally, our high likelihood areas here in red with yellow dots representing our plots. These plots were randomly selected in accessible properties in each of these categories, which included six US Forest Service properties, two wildlife management areas, and two private properties. Four of these locations had prior Bachman sparrow uh, records. Um, Gus Engling WMA in the post Oak Savannah region had uh, records as recent as 2018, while these three here in the um, Piney Woods region have regular occurrences every year. 
Access to these properties enabled us to survey in an array of different habitats across East Texas um, to help us determine which site characteristics uh, were most associated with Bachman Sparrow occupancy. And we surveyed these sites using autonomous recording units, um, which operate similar to game cameras, but instead of capturing photographs, they capture audio. We specifically used song meter, uh, wildlife acoustics, song meter minis, and song meter fours, or SM4s, or SM4s, um, to detect Bachman sparrows. Um, and each of these plots was surveyed for five consecutive days um, in the spring uh, with a recording schedule of five minutes every half hour starting at sunrise and ending three hours after sunrise. So a total of 30 minutes recorded each day for five consecutive days. And we repeated these surveys later in the summer to account for any seasonal changes in detection. We used wildlife acoustics kaleidoscope software uh, to scan for Bachman sparrows in the spectrogram, which is a visual representation of sound with frequency on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. Um, and this here is a, an example of a typical Bachman sparrow song. Um, they have a, a very diverse repertoire, but this is their most uh, mostly used song um, with an introductory whistle followed by a trill. So this is a very distinct spectrogram signature, and it's very easy to uh, pick out um, in acoustic space. At each plot, we also measured habitat characteristics, um, local site covariates, including basal area, canopy height, percent ground cover of grass, orbs, leaf litter, and bare ground using Daubenmeyer method, canopy cover, mid-story density, and shrub foliage density. And we measured these habitat variables specifically because previous studies had indicated that these or similar metrics um, were associated with Bachman sparrows in other parts of uh, the country. Previous studies have also indicated that isolation of habitat negatively impacts Bachman sparrow occupancy. Uh, for example, in this figure here, adapted from um, a paper by Dunning et al. in 1995, indicates that Bachman sparrow density here on the y-axis decreases the further you get from a source population. And because of this, we also calculated the proximity of each of our plots to a source population to see if this pattern existed in Texas. And we derived our source populations um, from these training data sites that were used to develop the Anderson and Bovis species distribution model, which are these white dots on the map here. And to support our occupancy modeling efforts, we also measured variables that might affect the detection of Bachman sparrow. Uh, we recorded photo period, uh, precipitation, Julian date, wind, and temperature. But we also considered spatial factors that might possibly influence detection as well, which is common for occupancy studies like this. All these data were then used in an occupancy modeling procedure using the package unmarked in R. Um, and we modeled Bachman sparrow detection by correlating our detection history with our measured detection covariates and to create a list of um, a priori detection models. And we used a uh, quality metric, in this case, quasi-AIC, to rank our models. Um, and the top ranked model uh, was selected to predict Bachman sparrow detection probability. We then incorporated our detection model into all of our a priori occupancy models, uh, which were produced by pairing presence and absence data with our habitat measurements. And the uh, um, top ranked model was then selected um, to predict Bachman sparrow occupancy probability. Now, one important note, um, one important point that I should note is that because variance inflation factor did indicate there was collinearity of our, our multicollinearity of our ground cover covariates. Um, we combined the grass ground cover covariate and the forb ground cover uh, covariate. We summed their values um, to create this single covariate herbaceous ground cover, because both of these uh, both of these parameters have been indicated to be important for Bachman sparrow occupancy, and we model we wanted to model the effect of both. This enabled us to do so without violating the assumptions of occupancy modeling. So getting into our results, um, our plots 
from the area that was categorized as low likelihood of Bachmanspera occurrence in the species distribution model had a wide range of habitats um, coming from open prairie and uh, cattle pasture to dense bottomland hardwoods, um, none of which are suitable for Bachman Sparrow based on the literature. And unsurprisingly, we did not detect any Bachman Sparrow in this category. Um, the plots located in the medium likelihood category were kind of a mixed bag, uh, with most sites being uh, mixed hardwood and pine with some intense succession taking place with lots of muscadine, yelpon holly, um, and sweetgum overtaking the understory. Um, but some of the sites uh, were, um, based on prior Bachman Sparrow literature, actually suitable for Bachman Sparrow, uh, such as this site of the South Boggy Slough Conservation Area, um, this one at Gusting Lane Wildlife Management Area. Um, but despite this, we did not uh, detect any Bachman Sparrow in the medium category area. Many of the plots in the high likelihood category were actually similar to those in the medium category with um, some intense succession taking place. This, you can see in this picture there's loads of sweet gum in the understory and um, essentially no grass. Some of them had uh, more further along succession with a uh, woody component in the midstory and nearly no grass component on the forest floor. But about probably about half of our sites in this category had which you might consider classic pine savanna, which is well managed uh, with a frequent um, burning regime. Um, and this led to Bachman Sparrow being detected in about half of our high likelihood category plots. So we ended up with a total of 40 Bachman Sparrow plots, or 40 plots with Bachman Sparrow detections, uh, which is a naive occupancy estimate of 0.17, or what that means is 17% of all of our surveyed plots had Bachman Sparrow, and all of them were located in the high likelihood category of the species distribution model. Uh, in 2020, we detected Bachman Sparrow in only 30% of our high category plots. And in 2021, we detected them in 70% of our plots. This would suggest that looking on a broad scale, that this species distribution model does accurately categorize regions as low, medium, or high relative likelihood of occurrence. But ultimately, it's not very usable on a fine scale, as it predicts, accurately predicts Bachman Sparrow occurrence only 50% of the time. Um, so although these results do elucidate patterns of Bachman Sparrow occurrence in the state, it's still crucial to understand the drivers of these patterns to improve on our knowledge of where these spe the species might occur in the state. And this is where our occupancy models uh, results are key. Um, because these, this model can be used to predict on a finer scale where Bachman Sparrow should occur in the state based on site characteristics. Detection in our top model was best predicted by spatial factors. Um, Bachman Sparrow had a higher probability of detection uh, represented here by lowercase p um, on the y-axis and there's our values of herbaceous ground cover on the x-axis. So um, Detection, probability detection increased with increasing herbaceous ground cover, um, and the probability of detection decreased as mid-story density increased. And this could suggest that um, plots with improved habitat have a higher chance of detecting Bachman Sparrow on repeated surveys, um, or perhaps that lower quality plots that are occupied by Bachman Sparrow comprise maybe only a small portion of their territory leading them to be detected less often. Um, our top occupancy model indicated that Bachman Sparrow occupancy probability, represented here on the y-axis as psi, also increased and was highest um, when herbaceous ground cover was high and was lowest when herbaceous ground cover was low. Similarly to our detection results, uh, the probability of occupancy was highest when your mid-story is really open and lowest when your mid-story is really dense. Um, but there was also an effect of basal area and canopy height um, as interactive terms. Um, in this figure here, we can see that darker areas represent 
uh, higher probability of black atmosphere occurrence or occupancy. And canopy heights here on the y-axis and basal area on the x-axis. Um, and from this figure, we can see that uh, probability of Bachman Sparrow is really low uh, when your basal area is really high and your canopy height is really high, similar to dense hardwood forests. And um, it's similarly unlikely when basal area is really low and canopy height is really low. Where occupancy is highest is when canopy height is moderately high and basal area is low, um, which is characteristic of your typical pine savanna or oak savanna. Not surprisingly, our top model also indicated that the probability of Bachman Sphere occupancy decreased as you got farther from a source population. Um, so at, at sites farther out than about 25 kilometers, the probability of Bachman Sphere occupancy drops to nearly zero. And this means that Bachman Sphere are unlikely to occupy a plot, even if it has suitable habitat, if it's isolated from source populations. Uh, for example, at this spot here at South Boggy Slough Conservation Area is recently restored shortleaf pine savanna um, and it has introduced a uh, reintroduced colonies of red cockaded woodpecker and the habitat is otherwise great for Bachman Sparrow, but the site is so far away from the nearest Bachman Sparrow source population, about 50 kilometers away or more, that it makes it really challenging for it to host uh, or sustain a population. So how can these results be used to inform state agencies and land managers on how to man uh, monitor and manage for Bachman Sparrow? Well, firstly, our occupancy model suggests that management should focus on reducing basal area and mid-story density in pine and oak stands. And this will allow sufficient sunlight to reach the forest floor and promote um, the production of grass and forbs. Secondly, um, these habitat characteristics are maintained by fire. So this model tells us that frequent fires are necessary um, to reduce the amount of woody vegetation in the understory, which allows these fire adapted herbaceous plants to dominate. Finally, our results demonstrate that habitat fragmentation may be inhibiting movement of Bachman Sparrow to isolated populations or habitat. In Texas, the landscape is pretty patchy um, with lots of short rotation timber stands, um, which are typically not managed to promote suitable habitat for Bachman Sparrow. So as a result, suitable habitat exists in these isolated islands um, in this sea of, of short rotation timber. And um, this can create great distances that will exist among populations or between populations in restored habitat. And that creates a significant challenge for Bachman Sparrow dispersal. Restored habitat is often too isolated from populations to promote discovery or sustain healthy populations. And so management should really focus on increasing connectivity of restored habitat and creating habitat corridors that facilitate dispersal and movement among populations. This may be why we didn't detect any Bachman Sparrow in post oak savanna, specifically at Gus Ingling uh, Wildlife Management Area despite there being records in the last decade. Although this habitat exists um, for Bachman Sparrow there, it just might be too isolated, too far from source populations um, for them to be able to recolonize it or, or sustain healthy populations. So based on our occupancy modeling results, uh, what might a more accurate species distribution model look like for the species in the state? I think a more accurate species distribution model should better represent the patchiness of available habitat for the species. Um, it should be less generous with its high and moderate categories, so um, narrow ranges for both those categories. I think a future species distribution model could be improved by incorporating stand level predictors such as basal area, canopy height, and maybe even the frequency of fire to more accurately predict patterns of occurrence on a finer scale. And perhaps they could use our detection data as training data to, to build a new model. So now we have elucidated uh, the spatial drivers of occurrence for Botman Sparrow in Texas. Um, and knowledge of where species is likely to occur is crucial, but knowledge of when the species is, like to is likely to be found is also key. 
So the second part of this study addresses the singing phonology of Bachman's Fair in Texas. And that term phonology simply refers to the cyclical patterns of, at, of activity of an organism um, and refers to the timing of certain behaviors like singing and uh, nesting. And these activities can be affected by biotic factors, um, such as mate and food availability. Um, but these biotic factors are typically in turn driven by abiotic factors like rainfall, photoperiod, and temperature. The photoperiod and temperature are the two primary drivers of songbird phonology based on the literature. An increase in photoperiod will kickstart a hormonal response that activates singing behavior and territorial establishment by adult songbirds. Um, rising temperatures can increase invertebrate activity and vegetative growth, which enables birds, uh, songbirds to meet the demands of reproduction. But on a smaller scale, uh, variation in activity can be affected by abiotic factors uh, like rainfall or strong wind that can reduce an organism's activity um, and extreme temperatures that can affect the amount of energy an organism is willing to commit to certain behaviors like breeding or singing. Therefore, it's crucial to understand the drivers um, of phenology in target species that can help us to maximize their detection. Our study species, Bachman sparrow, um, can be very difficult to detect visually, and it's best detected by its loud and persistent song. Despite this uh, little empirical Crash, I think my I think my my Webex crashed there. Yeah, I we had a comment from someone else um, that was asking whether you might have lost your connection as well. So we can hear you now though. Okay. Um, let me see if I can all right, I need to be made a presenter to share content again. Sorry about that. Where did I leave off? Uh, do you recall this? Have I gone through this yet? Yes, that one. And maybe if you pick up on uh, from this slide or this okay. slide. Yep. yep. OK, I'll start from here. OK, so sorry about that, y'all. Um, uh, our study species bought one sparrow is very difficult to detect visually, um, but it is best detected by its loud and persistent song. Um, despite this, uh, little empirical information exists on its singing phonology. Um, some accounts uh, indicate that it sings from February to August, um, but an empirical study is needed to investigate the drivers of singing phonology across the entire calendar year to inform monitoring efforts on periods and conditions of uh, peak detectability. And we hypothesized that on a seasonal scale, uh, photo period and temperature uh, would drive singing phonology. But on a daily scale, an increase in wind and rain um, can decrease singing behavior. So we surveyed nine sites uh, within the Angelina National Forest in East Texas. Um, at sites that had consistent and recent Bachman Sparrow records from uh, U.S. Forest Service point count surveys. There are these gold stars here. 
And again, we used uh, wildlife acoustics, song meters, and wildlife acoustics kaleidoscopes, as in the first um, chapter, to detect Bachmann sparrow. On the same schedule, which is five minutes every half hour starting at sunrise until three hours after sunrise, or a total of 30 minutes each day. However, we surveyed, we surveyed on this schedule for two years, um, every day for two years from February 2020 to March 2022. And we collected uh, temperature, wind, and precipitation data um, for the three hour recording period um, from the nearest US Forest Service weather station. And uh, we also calculated photo period and uh, Julian date um, for this as well. Uh, to assess the absolute singing period of Bachman Sparrow across the year, uh, we visualized patterns of singing phonology over time and to assess the effects of the abiotic parameters that we measured, we used mul multiple re logistic regression. Um, variance inflation factor indicated that Julian date had collinearity with other parameters, so it was not included in the list of a priori models. And that list of a priori models uh, was ranked by QIC, and the top most parsimonious model was selected um, for prediction. We use generalized estimating equations with an autoregressive structure. And our final model included the effects of photo period and precipitation on the probability of Bachmann sparrow singing. Models with temperature and wind did not rank highly, um, suggesting that those parameters didn't explain much of the variation in the data. My results indicate that the earliest Bachmann singing um, the Bachman Sparrow singing detection was uh, the 19th of January, and the latest was October 6. This figure shows Bachman Sparrow detection as black dots over time here on the x-axis and on the y-axis. Each of these are the sites that we surveyed, um, and they're listed from the best habitat quality up to the worst habitat quality. Unsurprisingly, our our poor quality plots did not receive, um, they had more inconsistent detections. Uh, we can see that singing behavior is pretty inconsistent before about mid-February um, and pretty inconsistent after mid-August, but March through March through mid-August is um, probably the peak Bachman Sparrow singing season. Results from our logistic regression showed that Bachman Sparrow is more likely to sing as photo period increases. There's probability of singing on the y-axis, photo period on the x-axis, and uh, the probability of singing increases with increasing photo period. This is likely the result of uh, hormonal response to that increase in daylight, and it's also likely the cause of singing cessation in the fall, since songbirds become photorefractory uh, for from hormonal deactivation of photosensitivity as day length begins to recede. So in other words, as day length begins to lessen, um, the hormones that react to that increased sunlight begin to deactivate, um, leading to a decrease and ultimately cessation of singing behavior in the fall as uh, daylight begins to recede. Uh, the results of our logistic regression also indicated that precipitation decreased uh, the probability of singing behavior, but this response was not found to be significant at a 95% confidence level. So our results did support a hypothesis that photo period is a strong driver of Bachman Sparrow singing phenology, but we were unable to support our hypotheses that precipitation or wind affect phenology at a statistically significant level. Wind did not appear in any of the top models, likely because there was very little variation in wind speed. It was constantly quite low at our sites. Um, but I think that significant wind, wind storms could likely still affect um, daily singing behavior, but we were unable to capture that um, in the study. Temperature likely also still affects Bachman Sparrow singing behavior. Temperature is known in the literature to affect daily variation in singing in songbirds uh, with increased singing on warmer days, uh, like this, this figure adapted from uh, Cusera et al. study on northern cardinals indicates that as the temperature increases, the probability of cardinal singing also increases. 
And this is uh, corroborated by anecdotal accounts uh, for Bachman Sparrow from, I think, the 19th century and the early 20th century. Um, but I think this that these anecdotal accounts focused more on the late winter um, when temperatures are more likely to fluctuate. So although this, this effect probably does exist during that time period, um, we were unable to capture that with this study. So what do these results tell us regarding management implications? Well, they tell us that monitoring efforts should be focused during months of peak detection, March through August, when photo period is high, and perhaps efforts should be focused during ideal environmental conditions as well. So this project has elucidated the spatial and temporal factors that drive patterns of occurrence and detection of Bachman Sparrow in Texas. And hopefully these results can be used to improve upon the species distribution model by Anderson and Bovis in 2013 and provide land managers with a clear understanding of how to move forward with conservation for the species in the Texas. A uh, big thanks goes to my advisor, Dr. Christopher Schock, and my committee members, especially Cliff Shackelford and Dan, Dr. Dan Sines, um, for their support and expertise and um, really helping this project come to fruition. And again, I think my funding sources, TPWD, State Wildlife Grant, and USDA, and McIntyre Stennis. Um, also big thanks to Forest Service and TPWD personnel for cooperation and coordination on site access, uh, TLL Temple Foundation and Rufus Duncan for access to uh, Boggy Slough and Scrappin Valley respectively. And of course, to my uh, wonderful technicians and colleagues who assisted me during the duration of this project from Stephen F. Austin State University. So thank you again. I'll be happy to answer any questions you'll have. All right, thanks, Liam. Um, so for anyone who has questions, please drop them in the Q&A. And again, you can get to that at the bottom of the screen where those three little dots are. And if you click on that, it should um, open up the option for you to type into a Q&A box. And at the moment, um, right now, I don't see any questions. Give folks a couple minutes though to see if, if they have any. All right, we do have a question. Um, so, is it possible to introduce the sparrows to the larger isolated habitats in order to rebuild the population there? Uh, I think I think it is. Possible. I think people have uh, attempted similar things. I think in Florida, there's, there was a study where, where people were trying to relocate Bachman Sparrow, um, but oftentimes they just ended up, you know, disappearing or traveling back to where they started from. Um, they were translocated birds with uh, transmitters, so they were able to track them back to their original locations. Um, so whether or not that would be successful is is you know, up for debate, um, but, you know, it could be worth a try. Uh, but of course, you know, there's probably permits and, you know, permissions that you have to get. You might know about that more than I, but um, I think I would like to see something like that happen. Um, you know how they do with recreated woodpeckers, the recreated woodpeckers are, are, those introduced colonies are pretty successful. Um, I would like to see a similar thing happen with Bachman Sparrow for sure. We have another question. Is the population still declining? Uh, my understanding is that yes, uh, Bach and Sparrow are still declining. I think uh, the most recent statistic um, was a 72% decline in the last, I want to say, 20 years. Um, and I'm not sure about in Texas. Um, I, I assume that they're still declining. I know that you know, we're, we're seeing these patterns, especially in the post oaks Mountain ecoregion, region where um, there had been populations that were well monitored, um, such as at Camp Maxi in, uh, I don't remember what county that is, somewhere in North Texas, and um, at Gus Engling. Um, but based on 
what I've heard in the last year or so. There's no more Falcon and Sparrow at Camp Maxi. There was a, a Sparrow survey there um, done by some, I don't remember which university it was, but um, they did a thorough catalog of all the sparrows at that spot, and they did not detect any Bachman sparrow. Um, and we didn't detect any Bachman sparrow at Singling, so I think that they are declining, um, especially on the fringe of their range. Uh, I think that the, the, the birds in the core populations in Angelina National Forest um, and Sabine National Forest, I think those populations are doing okay. But, you know, those are very well managed sites. I think that's the key, um, you know, to mitigating population declines. But yeah, to my understanding, they're still declining. Um, you know, that's that's important. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, what was the highest population density that you found? Uh, we didn't specifically measure density in our study. I think that the highest population densities that occur in Texas are probably in the Boykin Springs area. Um, I want to say the most sparrows we detected in one area was probably about three birds singing from one spot, and that was at Boykin Springs. Um, but again, we didn't specifically measure density, so I don't want to say, you know, I don't want to give a statistic that isn't true. Another question, uh, how does this decrease of the sparrow affect its ecosystem? That's a good question. Um, I think that the sparrows, you know, they probably do provide a prey source for um, some species, uh, I'm specifically thinking of like rat snakes, um, which do feed on Bachman sparrow. But Bachman sparrow are also ground nesters, so there's probably many varieties of snakes that feed on them. But, um, you know, they, they probably are also very important for seed dispersal because they do feed on um, blue stem seeds um, as well as uh, invertebrates. Um, so I would imagine that a decrease in Bachman sparrow um, would probably affect the ecosystem in that manner. But as I mentioned before, they are kind of bio indicators of pine savanna habitat quality. Um, and what that means is basically they're very sensitive to alterations uh, in the ecosystem. And so if you're noticing fewer Bachman sparrow, that's probably an indicator that something's not right with the ecosystem, um, the pine savanna ecosystem that they're in. Okay, thanks. Another comment question. This was a great presentation. Within the time period of active singing, March through mid-August, could you detect any peaks in singing, perhaps at the beginning of the nesting season when territorial defense was beginning, or in mid-June day, when day length was longest? From the data presented, singing rate seems to be surprisingly uniform. Uh, yes. Um, let me pull this up here. This figure, I forgot to mention it, um, but it is important. Um, this is a figure from a, uh, let me find it here real fast. It's a figure from a thesis by Robert Allen of the U.S. Forest, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And we noticed a similar trend with ours where March, this is about March, mid-March, is the peak uh, singing season for Bachman Sparrow. Um, here, at least here in Texas. And th that may differ geographically because uh, photo period uh, differs um, latitudinally. Uh, but here here in Texas, uh, it, uh, yeah, it's it's then when the birds are, before the birds have started nesting, I guess when they're pairing up, when they're setting up territories, late February, early March to mid-March is is the ideal time. If you, if you want to hear a Bachman Sparrow singing, that's the best time to do it. Okay, great. Uh, let's see here. Does anyone periodically confirm the methodologies with more plentiful birds? Confirm the methodologies. Uh, how, might need some clarification on that question. Sorry. Uh, 
Um, so I guess the response there was cross correlate habitat with sightings. Is that yes? Okay. So repeat the original question again. Sure. Uh, let's hear. Does anyone periodically confirm the methodologies with, I guess, using more plentiful birds? Hmm. Uh, so far, no, but um, I think that would probably be a good idea. Um, you know, kind of getting a finer scale look at, at you know, the habitat that these birds are using instead of taking a, a cast net approach where you're looking at the whole East Texas, look at just those areas where you know Bach and Sparrow are um, and comparing the results there. Yeah, I think that would be a good idea. We got another question here. You illustrated the importance of fire. Was the timing of fire important? Uh, yes, I would say that that previous um, papers have actually looked at that, that timing of fire um, during, I, I think, the not the breeding season, but the, the winter before um, is, is like the ideal, ideal time to burn to support buck and spare because they are reliant on grass, you know, they they need that disturbance to to promote the grass, but you know they need the grass there for their nest. So it has to be within. It has to be recently enough that there's not not a huge woods or woody uh, ground cover component, but it has to be far enough along that the grass has grown back. Um, and it was too complicated for us to incorporate that into our study, but there are other studies out there that do indicate that. Yes. Okay, another question. Is there a higher likelihood of occupancy in pine woodlands versus oak dominated woodlands? In Texas, yes. Um, and the reason for that is probably just because, you know, there's these habitats, uh, these pine savanna habitats that are managed specifically for that, uh, for there to be, you know, a lot of grass. Um, in post oak savanna, habitats, there are far fewer um, pristine, you might say, uh, pine or oak savanna habitats out there. So just inherently, there's going to be more Bachman sparrow in the pine savannas. But in in more northern populations in Arkansas and Oklahoma, um, I think even into Kentucky, Tennessee, there are some populations that do exist in these, these, these oak savanna habitats, um, just because there's there's the habitat there instead of shortleaf pine, which is, or slash pine, which are the other two pine savanna habitats that occur there. Um, I think there's just more pine savanna that's managed instead of oak savanna, and that's probably why there's more, there's higher occupancy rates uh, in pine savannas than oak savannas. Hey, that's all the questions that have come in for now. Um, Great questions. Thanks, everyone. We have a couple more minutes, so if, if anyone has any last minute questions, um, please go ahead and type them into the Q&A now. And um, Liam, could you go back to your last slide with your contact information, just in case anyone yeah, absolutely. wants to follow up with you later? One question that does come up um, that I will mention real quickly is the uh, pronunciation of the common name. Is it Bachman Sparrow or Bachman Sparrow? Most people say Bachman Sparrow because I think there's this, this, this bias towards it because of, you know, Bach, the composer. Um, but based on what, what I've been told, is that the individual himself, John Backman, pronounced his name Backman. So I guess technically the correct way to pronounce it is Backman Sparrow, right? Um, just an interesting note. But there is you know, some discussion on changing the name to Pinewood Sparrow, um, which is you know, more evocative and 
I think, a better fitting name for the species, personally. I'm so glad you addressed that, because that, <laughs> that was something I was definitely looking up as I was getting yeah. ready to um, to be the host on this. I'm like, well, I've heard, heard it both ways. So, yeah. um, well, this was wonderful. Thank you so much. And um, there are several comments that had, that had come in in the Q&A um, saying thank you for a great presentation. Yes, th thanks, y'all. Thanks for having me. This has been great. I'm always happy to talk about Bachman Sparrow. Feel free to contact me at the the Gmail address here, and I'll be happy to answer any other questions that you have.